Uh, hello everybody and welcome back to Cardiff Racing. Uh, this is our April update. So since our last visit, uh, a couple of changes have been made. Uh, we've put the vinyl onto the chassis. Uh, it's going to be all black uh, this year and we're going to put our own stickers on at a later date. We've also started doing some further assembly work. Uh, we've added bits and components onto the chassis to make it legal with requirements. And we've also started with assembly of some subcomponents. In terms of the suspension team, we have finalized making components. We've got now the front end of, of the car rolling um, as well as the back end. Uh, we've got all the wishbone manufacture out the way as well as push rods and tie rods. Uh, the engine team are now waiting on components. We're currently waiting for the radiators to be manufactured, uh, some of the drive components. Our fueling system is pretty much done um, as well as the air intake system of the car. So in summary, all the design work is completed and the team are now just waiting on the manufacture of components from external suppliers and in-house so that we can begin the final assembly of the car and we hope to be testing uh, in May. Now to tell us a bit more about the fueling system, here's Dan Rowland. Uh, so this year I've been working on the fueling system for the car. Um, one of the main changes is that we switched over to E85 as opposed to petrol. Um, with that has come uh, several design changes that need to be implemented. So E85 has a higher fueling requirement than petrol because it has a lower energy content. So you need to plug more of it into the engine to get the same amount of power out. With that, there are some advantageous properties in that it has a higher resistance to knock, so it has a higher run rating, which means we can tune the engine more aggressively and hopefully squeeze a little extra power from it. Um, it also has a cooling effect on the cylinders inside the engine, uh, which means we can get a more dense air-fuel mixture, more fuel and air into the engine and more power out. The components that I've mainly worked on is the fuel tank, which is just found here. Um, as I said, with the increased fueling requirements, the tanks had to get a lot bigger. Um, it's our first year with a new engine and a new fuel, so that's sort of a double challenge. We don't know exactly how much fuel we're going to need. So mainly, I've based my calculations off other teams that have used E85, and the tank has designed to be slightly over capacity than what we really need, because uh, we want to really guarantee that we finish that endurance event, which is worth so many points. Uh, most teams run about five, but in the past, a couple of teams have used up to seven litres on the endurance event, so we've gone for maximum just to guarantee safety. The fuel pump is mounted at the bottom of the fuel tank, which is about here in the chassis. Uh, from there, there's a fuel line running it up to a fuel rail, which will then inject the fuel into the runners as it enters the top of the cylinder. For the fuel injection, we're actually using the stock Triumph injectors. Uh, there was a little question as to whether they would be able to keep up with the capacity, having switched over to E85. Um, but yeah, we, we, we ran them in testing at the dyno and they were found to provide just as much fuel as we needed to get in there. Yeah, I've been working on all the drivetrain components, that's anything that connects the engine from its sprocket all the way to the uh, rear wheel hubs. So starting from the engine, we start at the small rear sprocket that comes out of the engine. This goes through a chain into a larger rear wheel sprocket, which we buy blank and then we machine to make a little bit bigger with six mounting holes which mounts onto one of our sprocket carriers, goes nicely onto the end of one of our differentials, which can then connect via a cup to a hub, which goes to the cup mount, sorry, which goes all the way to one of the rear hubs. And all that has to be calculated and the rear ratio has to be decided. So these are our differential mounts. Uh, they mount the differential to the frame. Um, normally, we have to have some sort of system to uh, pull back on the chain and tense the chain so it's at optimum performance. This year, what we've used is a set of push rods. You can see that these are two different lengths. And they're just, just like all the other push rods. You turn the centerpiece and they get longer and shorter, which effectively pulls back on the diff and pulls on the chain so we can reach an optimum tension. We've gone into uh, actuating the clutch with a servo motor. Um, hopefully making it all electronic, which mean, will mean there's less mechanical failures. Uh, we do still have an override if uh, in case it's necessary. Um, we also have a brand new clutch, new gearbox, new engine. Uh, the engine is a lot more reliable. It's not a race engine, it's a road engine. We should be able to do a lot more miles on it. Um, hopefully, this, we've, we think we've improved the general reliability and we're hoping to get a lot better results uh, this year, especially in the endurance where we failed last year. This engine normally runs a wet sump but it's a bicycle sump, so as it goes down, on bicycles when you corner, all the oil will stay at the bottom because you lean in. With these engines, all the oil would slosh to one side, so we've had to design uh, a new sump 
which is as shallow as possible. It has some buffling on the inside and some trap doors to make sure that the pickup is always wet and will always um, push oil back into the engine. We're also looking at putting a, a dry sump system in for next year, so just storing the oil externally, dripping it through the top, and then it doesn't matter if we pick it up or not because we have a big enough container. We'll go see one of my colleagues now that will walk you through uh, the valve bounce. So for my third year project, I've been um, working on analysing valve bounce in our Triumph motorcycle engine. Um, so this year, obviously, we've been given a new engine by Triumph to use on our Formula student car. So in order to understand its characteristics, we decided to test or analyse the valve bounce on it um, using a 3D vibrometer. Valve bounce is basically when, after the valve's gone through its actuation cycle, so it's opened and closed, sometimes at very high engine speeds, the valve will bounce, open again, and close the shot. So this happens due to the inertia of the valve, as well as resonance in the springs. If, obviously, the valve doesn't close or stays open longer than it should, you don't achieve optimum compression ratios or you might be letting too much fuel in, which again leads to inefficiency. We're using a laser vibrometer. Um, it's not here, unfortunately, but what it does is it shoots a laser onto the incident surface. So in this case, we're measuring the valves. And as you can see, we've got a bit of reflective tape here. Um, that's because you want as much backscatter of the laser as possible. And that backscattered light gets read by the vibrometer again and gets superimposed onto the initial laser beam. And that in turn can be analyzed um, and you can get the velocity of what you're pointing it at. We run the camshafts of the cylinder head using an electric motor. And the electric motor has a maximum speed of about 1300 RPM. We wanted to test this cylinder head at speeds approaching 5,000 RPM, which would translate to 10,000 RPM crankshaft speed because the cams have always got at half the speed of the crank. So the way we achieved this was having a one-to-one -one gear ratio on one side of this uh, drive pulley system. And on the other side, we had three different gearing ratios um, to simulate 5,000 RPM, 4,000 RPM and 2,000 RPM, just different speeds that we could test. Um, and this was achieved by using different size pulleys on the other end of the pulley drive system. So if we do find valve bounce is present at certain RPMs, um, there can be measures taken towards reducing its effect, such as modifying the cam profiles or changing the stiffness of the springs. Um, these are some of the things we can do to help reduce the effect of valve bounce.